Solid, liquid, gas. The whole universe is made of these three phases of matter, right? Wrong. Matter comes in a lot more varieties than you might think. The three phases of water that we're most familiar with, water vapor in clouds, steam, or liquid water. In addition to liquid, there's solid or ice. Notice how the phase or order increases as the temperature decreases, and it gets more chaotic and random as the temperature increases. If you put ice on a table, it'll still keep its shape for a little while till it pools out, forming liquid water, which will then flow over the entire surface. Eventually, if you heat it up, steam will flow outwards and will move in all directions. Temperature is tied to thermal energy, which is a measure of how chaotic a physical system is. Well, as it turns out, that doesn't just apply to small objects like ice and water molecules. The whole universe can be considered to have phases as well. The more energy in a given part of the universe, the more chaotic that part becomes. From active volcanoes on exoplanets or moons, to nebulae, to the swirling cores of galaxies harboring supermassive black holes. What's even more chaotic than gas? It's what lightning bolts in the visible part of fire and even the emission from enormous black holes are comprised of. It's called plasma. With its incredibly high thermal energy, plasmas are some of the most well-known destructive forces of nature, often called the fourth phase of matter. Rewinding a little bit, notice that the phases of water are distinct. There's no mistaking whether you're looking at ice, water, or gas. That's because the bonds between water molecules have different, well-calculated energies. When you excite the system beyond what those bonds can handle, they break apart and dissociate. New weaker bonds can take their place, but eventually you can dissociate those as well. Now, phases aren't always this obvious. How about slime? It's a river of slime! It can hold its shape, but slowly forms into a shapeless puddle. There's also asphalt. You'd think that our roads made of the substance would be pretty much rock solid. But this famous pitch drop experiment shows us that asphalt and similar materials are actually non-Newtonian fluids too. They're flowing. Glass even flows. Ancient glass in cathedrals and older structures shows a thickening towards the bottom because the glass is slowly flowing, even though it looks very solid, over millennia. And so it's actually thicker at the bottom due to gravitational flowing pulling on the glass molecules. Like people, some things change under pressure. You can actually make your own non-Newtonian fluid. It's called oobleck. Mix two parts of cornstarch to one part of water. What you get is Oobleck, a weird non-Newtonian material that's a solid when you hit it hard or apply sudden pressure, but a liquid when you touch it softly or apply light pressure. In Oobleck's case, the water molecules break up the cornstarch normally, making everything flow like a liquid. If you apply pressure though, the water gets forced out and the cornstarch binds to itself, kind of like a solid. Two different phases coexisting and only differing due to applied external forces, not something intrinsic. Now, let's shrink things down and get small, smaller than atoms. We're looking at electrons. We've discussed the applications of superconductors. We use them in the Simons Observatory as our detector mechanism. They're a mainstay of what's called condensed matter physics and have been on the scene since 1911 when good old Cameron Onnes discovered the first superconductor when he liquefied helium and demonstrated the property of zero electrical resistance as a function of temperature in ordinary materials, in this case, lead. Incredibly, there's another phase change that we've talked about in previous videos, along with Nobel Prize winner Bill Phillips in this video that I'll link to above, in the study of what are called Bose-Einstein condensates. What are these exotic phases of matter? Well, suppose you're lost in a crowd at the mall. Everyone's going this way and that, their own way, with their own identity and their own fashion sense. You can glance at a person and tell exactly how they're different from the person standing next to them. Now, instead, imagine you're in a crowd at a concert for a band you love. Everyone's dressed and moving and acting more or less the same way, right? As you get more harmony, more synchronization across the crowd, the individuals within that crowd become harder and harder to distinguish from one another. If you take it to the extreme, you get a condensate. <laughs> which is not applicable to ordinary human beings, but it's an extremely orderly state of matter where the individual particles become impossible to distinguish. Superconductors make use of this property, but hold that thought for now. Normally, electrons are what are considered fermions. 
These are subatomic particles that can only exist if they each have their own unique quantum state or identity. They follow the so-called Pauli exclusion principle that prevents them from occupying the same energy states at the same time. However, if you cool them down enough, they can form what's called a Cooper pair, named after Leon Cooper, my professor of quantum mechanics at Brown University where I got my PhD. The connections I made here endure to this day. Leon discovered this phenomenon allegedly riding the subway car back in the 1950s and solved a problem known for 50 years that even the great Richard Feynman couldn't solve. Boy, was he jealous when he found out what Cooper, Bardeen, and Schrieffer came up with. It's inconceivable and does something to me. This means that the individual particles, which are themselves fermions, can bond together, becoming a boson, which then lose in the Cooper pair configuration, lose their individuality, and could be compressed and occupy the same state. You could even have an infinite number of them in the same state. Suddenly, instead of a stream of individual fermionic electrons flowing through a piece of metal, you have an indeterminate sea of electrons that can seamlessly adapt to any change in the electric potential, flowing without resistance. That's what a superconductor is. The goal of many of my colleagues is to form a so-called high temperature or even a room temperature superconductor, which could be used for transportation, having power generation and power transportation across the world without loss. And this would be a revolution for humanity. And many people think it's just around the corner. The shift from individual fermionic electrons to Cooper pairs and the formation of a Bose-Einstein condensate inside of a crystal lattice, a metal lattice, it allows a uniform motion of the superconducting electrons. It's a type of phase change, fermionic to bosonic. It's pretty cool, right? Literally. Now, the BCS, or Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieffer superconductivity, doesn't apply to all types of superconductors. There are so-called unconventional superconductors. They don't follow BCS. So there's more to the story than we have time for today. Let's leave it at the understanding of the formation of a condensate of electrons, marking a phase change from non-superconductor to superconductor. And the phase is characterized by an order parameter, and that order parameter is controlled by the temperature of the system. Superconductors and the phase change involved is happening on the very, very small scale of the universe. Very large scale, things may be much the same. Many cosmologists believe that the universe has gone through a series of phase changes. We have evidence that the universe has dissociated the four laws of physics into at least three different laws, the laws of electricity and magnetism that are united at a high enough temperature or low enough temperature, depending on your perspective, with the weak nuclear force forming the electroweak theory. Now, that is a type of phase change from these forces being separate and distinct to them having a combined unified existence where they can be described as a single force, the electroweak force. It may be true that the strong nuclear force can be unified with the electroweak theory. That would create a so-called grand unified theory. And if we can modify and incorporate gravity, we'd get the so-called theory of everything, the TOE. And many people are trying to study the theory of everything and perhaps overlooking the gut, the grand unified theory. So I don't want to put the toe ahead of the gut. Very good, doctor. Very good. Part of what we have in the early universe could also represent a phase transition during so-called inflation, which we've talked about many times and will continue to talk about. The universe definitely did evolve from extremely high temperatures when it was dominated by radiation to then being dominated by ordinary matter that's not relativistic and eventually currently dominated by what is called dark energy. Those are different types of phases of the universe's evolution. And in each phase, the universe would have a different expansion history and properties. So-called Hubble parameter will change based on the composition that dominates the universe, radiation, matter, or dark energy. Let's examine another type of phase change using magnets. Any magnet you've seen has a north and south side or a positive and negative side, if you will. These opposite sides will attract and you can attract a compass needle to either the north or south pole, depending on its north or south pole. These opposites attract north to south and vice versa. Like poles, north and north will repel each other, just like south poles along with other south poles. We don't believe there is a magnetic monopole as I discussed in this video, in that if you break a magnet apart, you won't get an isolated north and south pole. You'll get two north poles and two south poles, one on each of the individual halves. Now magnets can exhibit phase transitions as well. And this was discovered by none other than Marie Curie. 
the great Madame Curie observed that if a magnet is heated above a certain temperature, it loses its magnetism. That temperature is called the Curie point. It goes from being a magnetic, magnetized phase to completely unmagnetized. That is a phase change. Heat is there we are. No applause. In an abstract sense, we have more than just solid, liquid, and gas to characterize the properties of materials and the forces of nature itself. And that brings us back to the very beginning, perhaps inflation. No, not the rising cost of bread and gas, but cosmological inflation. The idea that at some point in the extremely early universe, a quantum field pervaded the universe called the inflaton. Fluctuations in the inflaton caused different variations in the universe's space-time curvature providing places for ordinary matter and dark matter to accumulate, later leading to the formation of the first stars, galaxies, clusters, and eventually planets. Look familiar. People, podcasters. As we talked about in our video on magnetic monopoles, there could have been a surplus of magnetic monopoles produced in the early universe that were then inflated or spread out, such that there might be only one in our entire observable universe. The one that Blas Cabrera claimed to detect back in the 1980s on the so-called Valentine's Day event. But we don't have direct evidence for this theoretical phase change between the pre-inflationary plasma and the later post-inflationary primordial soup that formed the protons and neutrons that later formed the lightest elements on the periodic table. The inflation phase is very similar to the superconductor phase that we already discussed. The transition from disorganized to organized, again, as a function of temperature, as an order parameter that could lead to a very different early universe that could have just the right properties to create the very, very dynamic spectrum of different variables that we observe in our universe, different phases of matter and spectrum of forces and their strengths. It could be very, very similar to superconductivity. In fact, some people have speculated dark matter could be the manifestation of a superconducting phenomenon. So everything from electrons to ordinary matter to the universe itself has phases that describe its behavior through changing properties. And if you want to know more about the experimental quest to understand these phases in extreme conditions and fascinating experiments, just click here. <laughs>